So next we have Abby Burke. She is the Western Rivers Regional Program Manager for Audubon Rockies. Um, and through this, she promotes cultural change in water use and river conservation. And she has an interdisciplinary master's of education with ecology and hydrology conservation, or concentrations, and she is an avid whitewater kayaker. And so today her talk is on Confluence for Success, Uniting Policy Partnerships and Restoration for Lasting Winds. Thank you. Sure. Well, good morning. I'll give it a, a start while we're waiting for the presentation to pull up. Um, it's certainly a privilege to be here, and I want to thank Megan for, for having me um, come and present to you all. Um, it's certainly um, near and dear to my heart, um, some of this confluence of river and watershed management. And for Audubon Rockies, um, our regional office, we're a regional office of the National Audubon Society, and my territory kind of focuses on Colorado, but it also um, breeds into Utah and Wyoming. Thank you, Megan, very much. Okay. And home for me is the West Slope of Colorado, just outside of Grand Junction. And I'm a stream ecologist who finds herself in the world of water policy and um, working with on the ground freshwater habitat restoration. I've always been in and around rivers, you know, my whole life. I've logged over a thousand miles on rivers in Idaho, in Colorado, in Arizona, uh, and in Utah. And my time on rivers has showed me just how much rivers and watershed um, health needs us. Well, we're going to keep it moving along here. <laughs> I started with um, Audubon in 2013 as a um, as a volunteer, and I came on as a staffer in 2014. And my background in um, environmental consultants as well as a college biology professor um, has positioned me well uh, for a world of water policy and kind of serving as a bridge between the world of science policy and partnerships. Water is a key for National Audubon Society. It's one of our key strategic pillars, and our work in water covers coasts and saline lakes, western water, and with a focus on the Colorado River Audubon engages and involves the public on issues surrounding water rights and water quality, water policies and frameworks, and we work with restoring habitats along rivers, wetlands, and deltas. And we explore and implement water um, market-based solutions that contribute to the achievement of our water goals. And we do this with 1.7 million members across the country. And we have a dedicated um, local chapter um, presence and we also have an incredible staff from National that helps direct our work going forward. So in a nutshell, Audubon protects birds and the places they need today and tomorrow. Audubon focuses efforts on the Colorado River because of its critical importance for over 400 bird species and of course as a lifeline to communities and economies and agriculture across the West. The river flows through both the central and Pacific migratory pathway, or flyways, excuse me, and we are living in an uncertain future. We are living in a persistent drought since 1999 and coupled with intense variable hydrology in the Colorado River Basin. As Pat Mulroy, who was previously with Southern Nevada Water Authority, stated, you know, the, the Colorado River is a river ravaged by climate change. Between 2000 and 2014, we saw flows nearly 19% below the normal flow, if you will, between 1906 and 1999. Brad Udall and Jonathan Oberpeck published a study in February of 20, 2017 stating that potentially by mid-century we could see reduced flows in the Colorado anywhere between a reduction of 20% to maybe 35% in, you know, conservatively speaking, or potentially in severe cases up to, um, up to 55% um, at end of century. And in a river that every drop has already spoken for, it, it kind of calls on us to look and manage water a little bit more differently. So Colorado River hydrology is helping to change the conversation about water. 
It's actually an exciting time to be in Colorado River management with the passage of the drought contingency plan and the upcoming kickoff of the renegotiations of the 2007 interim guidelines. And just to kind of recap some of my work um, as well, you know, the Colorado River is arguably the most complicated system of water in the world with prior appropriation and the doctrine um, and the law of the river, I mean, couple this with climate change and variable hydrology and real observable trends, all of this is driving work right down to the ground. And so the work that um, I, I do for National Audubon is really to use the best available science, harness multiple partnerships, uh, inform and engage our network, and help move water awareness and fluency forward because, as you know, we are never alone in a drought. And all water users must understand the risks, and we must explore every option to save water. Um, not only do we work with water awareness and fluency, but also trying to bring resilience into um, freshwater habitat as well as agriculture as we're looking at a variable hydrology future. And most of my work is actually working with stakeholders and using all of this to help shape and kind of influence different water frameworks going forward. So hydrology is driving change in the Colorado River Basin and work in river management policy and frameworks and watershed management. Um, we need flexible water sharing and on the ground freshwater habitat restoration now more than ever. And cons you know, conversations around water have also been changing. There's more collaboration and conversations are becoming more inclusive. There's a lot of work to be done, but we are seeing some successes for people and nature. So reflecting on what nuggets of wisdom that I could offer this audience, you know, how do we shortcut and accelerate lasting wins for restoration and projects that benefit both people and the environment? And to me, that's talking about partnerships. And as I mentioned, the conversation around water has been changing in the West. Watersheds and water truly does connect us. You know, we are, you know, sometimes we think of water on opposing sides of the spectrum. But more truthfully, there's much more uh, that water and our watersheds actually connect us than it does separate us. So looking at some of the common values of our watersheds, you know, healthy flowing rivers, recreation, beautiful scenery, wildlife watching, reduced flood risk, wildfire mitigation, clean, reliable drinking water, um, thriving communities and economies. You know, these are core values of ranchers. These are core values of folks that live in cities. These are core values of wildlife watchers as well as hunters. These are also core values of, dare I go political for a moment, Republicans and Democrats. These are core values of peoples of all backgrounds. And so um, I'd like to take a deeper look at this and kind of some of the areas and um, the territories that I work with within Utah and Wyoming and Colorado. You know, in, excuse me, in Utah, you know, from the conservation in the West Pole, 76% um, of folks believe it's important for states to use funds to protect and restore the health of rivers, lakes, and streams. In Colorado, we jump up a little bit to 83%. And in Wyoming, we have 74% of folks. So this is a core value going forward. And you know, the, the vast majority of our territory is in agreement that these projects um, that help protect and restore healthy rivers, lakes, and streams um, are critical. But can we talk about, is there political support? How about funding? What is the best available science for ecological functions and services? How about enduring local constituency to champion a project? <laughs> My presentation, apologize, he's wanting me to move forward. <laughs> so. That's okay, that's okay. And, um, you know, and what about the considerable hurdle of land ownership? How do we work with private, federal, and state lands even? And so, how do we get here for successful projects? And to me, that answer is partnerships. 
They take thought, they take some work, and they are not built overnight. And so I was excited to hear um, the previous speakers also mentioned um, the key for partnerships and that, that need of multiple stakeholders and, and communications. So I'd like to kind of pivot and kind of frame um, some of the work that I've witnessed and I've been a part of and um, kind of find that there are four sections, four areas of partners that when engaged in a balanced way can be incredibly helpful and supportive for long lasting, for long lasting project wins. And um, these are not perfect partitions or boxes um, to think of all the partners to consider, but it's kind of a simplified way that we can kind of, without getting too complicated, get us thinking about how to enrich our project base. Each of these four areas have strengths and dare I say weaknesses. So I'm gonna go through what I have found to be some of the highlights and also maybe some of the limitations in each one of these kind of sectors. So nobody gets your feelings hurt. <laughs> We're gonna go forward um, in a way that kind of talks about some of the highlights and again, some of the, the restraints going forward. So if you find yourself in the world of academics or in science, that you certainly are creating state of the science information. You're solving practical problems, you're developing new technologies, and you're making informed decisions either individually or collectively. So let's talk about some of the limitations. And so when I talk about some of the limitations, this is all generally speaking. And so I know um, this might not speak exactly to you or to your work, um, but generally because of maybe financial or bureaucratic or capacity or resources, um, you know, or maybe just even the structural setup, there are some restraints. And so for science and academics, how is your information translated uh, to action by practitioners? Is it understandable and relevant to consultants and contractors getting the work out on the ground? Is it funding limited? Is it funder driven? Um, are there data challenges? Is there try again, proprietary data, incomplete data, and are there long-term data sets? Um, how's your communication and outreach piece? And are state and federal agencies in the know and using new scientific techniques? Okay. So moving on to some of the agency's sides. So both state and federal. And the pros certainly are that within agencies, you have a large landscape of management and oversight. You are, have the ability to establish overarching goals of programs. You have a scalable presence um, from you know, down on the ground into personable um, on-location offices to a larger presence potentially in, in uh, DC. And you bring large volumes of expertise going forward. Again, limitations, some of just very generally speaking here. Um, capacity in funding and in staff. Uh, restrictive timelines for projects. Tracking and monitoring a project success. And what even does project success actually look like? Are we seeing landscape wins or are there knitted together kind of random acts of conservation? Um, is there a direct connection to the public and how do you market your programs? And again, that comes an outreach piece. And also the question of turnover. Um, you know, as, as we're kind of having new people come into positions or, or move through, there's a starting from scratch in that trust and that relationship building once again. So again, you know, not all of these apply, but just some of these things that I've seen generally speaking in some of the broad stakeholder work that I, that I work in. Um, political appointees, moving on. Um, some of the pros, um, a large ability to influence programmatic momentum. The ability to make sure programs have enough money. Um, the ability to bring legislative attention and support coming forward to a program. And also the ability to convene large stakes of influencers and bringing folks together to create opportunities. Some of the limitations, sometimes consistency and a consistent track and direction for programs. Oftentimes, there are short-term limits for long-term challenging problems. Kind of a newbiness at times, kind of a lack of famili familiarity or a shallow knowledge base with in-depth and complex challenges such as Western water issues. 
large part of my work is working with new legislators, kind of bringing them up to speed on the challenges of water in Colorado and on the Colorado River. Um, public trust, public trust can come and go pretty quickly. And is there political pressure from parties, from external forces, from special interests? And of course, there's competing priorities. And so in our last kind of group here, talking with conservation, um, non-governmental organizations or NGOs, some of the pros um, with NGOs are the ability to have large grassroots in-depth networks. Um, there's a direct connection to the public or a volunteer base to help projects get done. NGOs can also create a large groundswell of support or defense on different issues. Um, NGOs can elevate advocacy with tools generated by the, the academics or science folks and agencies, gives a bump to the credibility of NGO advocacy, as well as helps get tools out um, to the public um, that are generated by agencies and um, in, in academia. NGOs also have a greater amount of flexibility. Um, NGOs can do advocacy. None of these other boxes can do that. Um, and can grow public will to influence political will and dollars. Um, and of course, comms um, for communications. NGOs can be great translators of information um, from science uh, to the public or science to decision makers. And of course, um, bar none, NGOs bring a passion for an issue going forward. Some of the limitations, it's kind of the same things. Um, funding and funder driven, capacity, sometimes territoriality especially even territoriality for credit, you know, for, for, credit for projects. Um, and effective NGOs um, can also influence, um, or the influence that NGOs have can sway depending on the different decision makers that are in office. Um, so there can be some political roadblocks. So I want to pause for a moment, and I want to take a look at all the assets. If we look at all the assets in all of these different boxes, um, alone, any one of these entities or boxes kind of lack the ability for durable, uh, publicly celebrated and ecologically meaningful projects. Um, but together, and this is just my, my advice going forward, don't keep speaking to your choir. Broaden the table and bring some more chairs. I'd like to take a moment, I'd like you to raise your hand if you currently identify with one of these people or one of these boxes in any of these. Are you an agency? Are you an academic? Are you a political appointee or with an NGO? Can you raise your hand? Good. Can you keep your hand, I'll keep them up. Keep your hand lifted if you are working with two partners outside of your, of your box. Good. Keep your hand lifted if you are working with three different people outside of your box. Okay, this is, that's good, that's good. It helps to bring some resiliency going forward. And so, you know, looking at this, I know it's a great picture, um, there's a balancing point of on-the-ground partnerships balanced with water policy and science, full funding, action, also guided by science, and this all translates to success on the ground. But again, I want to put an asterisk on success because that really depends on how we define it going forward. And so if you're, st you're standing on one foot balancing all of this work, it's a little slippery if someone sneezes or sways a little, you know, how do you make sure your project is sustainable and resilient going forward? Okay. And so I'd like to briefly go through a couple of fast examples here and um, talking about how some of the partnerships have really created a meaningful on-the-ground wins. In December of 2016, um, the Colorado River's Headwater Project was awarded $7.75 million to address watershed and water use impacts um, within the Upper Colorado River Headwaters, where approximately 65% of the Colorado's native flow is diverted across out of basin into the Front Range Territory. And the project was spearheaded by, um, by Trout Unlimited, as well as with support from American Rivers and key agricultural interests. Every one of these partners played a key role in achieving this $7.75 million that is now an implementation phase. And when this project is complete, more than 30 miles of the Colorado River and 4,500 acres of irrigated ground will have improved treatments upon it. 
Um, it's been a tremendous win. And as I've said, how the conversation around water has been changing and is becoming more inclusive, a collaboration like this would be unheard of five, even 10 years ago. Um, and so this is a real win for sure going forward. Colorado just finalized its first, its very inaugural water plan in 2015. And with this, it was a, an enormous collaborative project with all stakeholders coming to the table from agricultural to municipal and industrial to NGOs. And um, you know, all across the board, it was Colorado's largest civic engagement and it broadened out. There was a symbiotic relationship between the state and NGOs and other organizations to work collaboratively and together to come forward with our first water plan. And it was a huge win. Um, implementation is taking a little bit longer than hoped um, with this plan because of lack of funding um, and also some capacity. So we're working together, NGOs and the state are working together to create down to the ground projects. In our water plan, 80% of all priority watersheds will have a watershed management plan by 2030. And so that is incredibly ambitious. And so folks are working together to get these real actions on the ground done. And quickly, I'd like to also talk about um, the Colorado River Delta. So within the work on the Delta, um, my good friend and colleague Jennifer Pitt with National Audubon um, has been spearheading this effort for years. The Delta was a two million acre ecosystem at the downstream end of the Colorado River. Uh, historical accounts say that the sky was darkened by the number of birds that existed there. And this is a quite a different scene that we have today. As, our, as the Colorado River was developed over the 20th century, the delta dried out and inadvertent impacts to water development, you know, completely took every drop. Um, today, the supply and demand imbalance that dried the delta is being exacerbated by climate change. And the Colorado River water users are also experiencing shortages. So NGOs are working together in the Raise the River Coalition to advocate for bilateral solutions to environmental challenges in the delta. Over time, NGOs figured out that the way, um, the way to get U.S. and Mexico to address habitat restoration in the Delta was to get the U.S. and Mexico working together on a broader set of issues on the Colorado River, including water shortage sharing in the context of climate change. And so I'm going to go quickly through some of these slides here. This is a picture um, with minute 319 you might have heard of in 2014 when the first pulse flow of water was delivered to the Delta. This is the first water spilling over the rocks um, when the gates of the Morelos Dam were opened in 2014. And uh, soon the pulse flow had created a river once again. And the people of the San Luis Rio, Colorado and Mexico were there to greet it and form quite possibly the, the largest spontaneous river fiesta ever um, in the celebration of the return of the river. And going forward, it has been critical um, that restoration also includes um, delivery of water for environmental flows, which has been uh, negotiated with largely with a, the binational agreement, NGOs at the table helping to facilitate some of these conversations and negotiations going forward. And as well, um, here are also some of the native trees that are shown um, that were planted in NGO greenhouse. And acre by acre, we're restoring nature in the Colorado River Delta um, with a long-term vision for seeing the river return to the sea. And so I have just a few takeaway thoughts here, um, working with partnerships for, for many years now with National Audubon. I want you to remember um, that communication with partners can help address um, bumps early on in a project, in the planning and the implementation phase. And it also helps you to weather bumps down the road. Um, continuing that groundswell of support is also key for communications. And it's important to see how your communications are structured, both internally and externally. There are opportunities to tell the story of how project implementation is championed by people, or maybe wildlife um, served by that project. Those are powerful stories. I want to also encourage you to think about building a solid foundation for multiple partners. Remember the balancing slide uh, with all the guys in the support fellows standing on one foot? You don't want to be that guy. 
you want to have a strong base. Looking at this Jenga picture, I'm a huge Big Bang fan. I hope some of you guys enjoy it too. Um, structurally, this is so much more sound in the shape than balancing on one foot. Remember the different pieces or partners. Um, they can move, but the overall shape still remains. And make sure you recognize your project wins and incorporate your storytelling of successes across. And make sure your partners can tell your story. Don't run alone. If there's any sort of transition, um, you need to continue on that legacy of why your project matters, why it's important, and make sure that you, you do, you're not the only person in your box, so to speak, going forward in this project. You need to be able to weather change. And also make sure that your partner's needs are supported. And by far, people love partnerships. Whether it's the public, whether it's funders, you know, folks contributing data, could your project include cultural and tribal partners? Also, think of non-traditional partners too. Bring in oil and gas, ranchers, a county commissioner and a biologist and see what happens. Um, going forward, I want you to think about being creative in your projects and partnerships. When it comes down to it, um, we are living in an uncertain hydrologic future and we need as many tools in the toolbox as possible. And also remember that most of hydrology and watershed issues are deeply connected to people. Their understanding of the issues, perspective and traditional usages even, because there's anxiety around water, that just means it's important. And listen to people's needs. There's a lot of people management in river and watershed management. And lastly, there's an, there is a sense of urgency to find solutions for water resiliency because of climate change. The water project and solution table is indeed gradually getting bigger and more diverse chairs are in fact coming to the table. There's plenty of work to be done and we are getting further down the path. You know, it's pretty remarkable. And I want you to continue to remember that you are also, you are start maybe in your box, but hopefully our conversation today has helped you to think about ways that you can move further um, outside of the box. Because we need more multi-benefit water and watershed projects now more than ever, and partnerships are key to this. Um, encourage you to develop rich and diverse partnerships for your projects, and you will see lasting wins and probably a couple of lifelong friends along the way. And so remember, you are outside of your box now. With that, thank you. We have time for about two questions. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thanks for your interesting talk. Uh, yeah. As a sociologist, I really appreciate your last one. Great, great. Um, but I'm wondering in your quadrant of the different mm -hmm. kinds of actors in these things, one, one group that I think mean seems missing mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. like consultants. Oh, absolutely. Uh, because they seem to be really key actors in the mm -hmm. restoration work. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. No, thanks for recognizing that. And really, we, I oversimplified the quadrants, so there wasn't maybe six to eight different boxes up there um, to dive a little bit deeper into. And in my world, um, with working with freshwater habitat restoration and so working so closely with consultants, oftentimes I feel like consultants are our right arms um, going forward, but they are also the right arms of, oftentimes of different agencies and for the state. Um, so the consultants can be in several different boxes as they're hired to do um, the work that, that's needed. And, you know, oftentimes, I mean, it can also be in the world of academia. So consultants, in my humble opinion, fit into all the different boxes and how they work, but their work is off you know, is key in order to translate the results down to the ground from whatever, um, you know, mission that has been brought forward or project base uh, for that particular consultant. Yeah, in the middle. The bigger picture because they feel like they have a very narrow mandate. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, in Western water, there's, <laughs> there's quite a bit. Um, I really focus on this, this people aspect and listening. If you go deep enough in with them, even as obstinate uh, or an opposite size as you feel a potential partner could be, with deep enough digging, there's still common ground and trying to focus on that particular common ground. Whatever that common ground is, that common value, start from there. And it's a lot of listening to somehow find that common ground. Um, in abilities to work with different water developers um, as well as irrigation districts. There's a lot of resistance, um, but truly when it comes down to it, some of the common core values that I see that go across the plains are wanting to see healthy flowing rivers. There's recreational experiences. If folks have had time with their families out on rivers, maybe angling or floating, whatever it might be, there's some place to start and it takes a lot of conversation as well as listening in order to find that platform that you can move forward together. And it might be just the smallest, but over time as these partnerships are built and are strengthened, I've seen oppositional fo folks actually be tremendous allies going forward for different funding um, proposals and project suites. So it's not easy. It's not a one, a one, um, a one solution type of thing. It's very much in the context of your different partnerships that you form, but they're, they're worth the time to find that because you're, you're reducing your opposition in the long run as well, and working together. All right, let's thank Abby for her talk. Thank you.